What's up, everybody? So as promised, today the first thing we want to do together is go over a numerical example to see how we could apply the theory we've seen so far in this chapter to a specific practical application in terms of finding or calculating the KP and KD control gains of a modified PD controller to satisfy, to satisfy some requirements as provided by a client. Then right after that, we're going to jump into the second part of the uh, time domain specifications and specifically look at the steady state specifications. Okay, but first let's go over this quick example that will hopefully kind of pull everything together in terms of transient uh, specifications and how to use that to ultimately design a controller. So, example. So the objective here again is to design a modified PD controller for a spacecraft characterized with the principal moment of inertia J equal to one. Okay, so single axis controller because we're using the assumption that the body fix a reference frame is a principal axis body fixed reference frame and furthermore we are again assuming that the x y z components of the angular velocity vector seen in that reference frame are considered to be small and that's why we are doing one axis at a time only so this modified pd controller will be applied to uh, one axis only all right so the specs are given as mp equal 30 percent maximum overshoot. We have a settling time or stabilization time equal to 100 seconds and a rise time equal to 30 seconds. There's no spec on the time of the first week. Fine, the client doesn't mind about that. So that's all we have to, uh, to play with. Which means that I, right here, that is a very reasonable a spec to rotate a spacecraft about one axis at a time. So we want the angle about one axis to stabilize within a minute and a half, more or less. So that, that makes kind of sense. And we allow some maximum overshoot of 30% and we want the rise time to be this, meaning that if you were to look at the time history of the spacecraft angle, one of them could be roll pitch high, doesn't matter. We want that kind of response, or rather the client wants that kind of response, where we remain within 2% of the final value at 100 seconds, where the maximum overshoot compared to the final value is 30 percent and where the rise time here is 30 seconds so as long as we design a modified pd controller that will be able to achieve this or better than that our job will be over nice so i like to start by analyzing the uh, specs given to me always from ps because to me, this is the easiest among all uh, transient time domain specifications. So let's do that. TS, we said that that was 3.9 over zeta omega n, 100 seconds. Or alternatively, this means that you're going to get 0 0.039 equal to zeta omega n. Now I don't know my zeta yet, I don't know my omega n, so the best I can do is to leave these together, but that's fine because that gives me actually the real part of my closed loop poles that kind of define the boundary of acceptable settling time or TS values and unacceptable on the right side of this boundary line that corresponds exactly to TS equal 100 seconds. So anywhere along this vertical line, 
as we talked in the previous lecture, we're going to end up with settling time equal to 100 seconds because settling time is only related to the real part of my poles. And this is zeta omega m. In that case, uh, we are allowed to be pretty close to the uh, origin of the complex plane, right? 0.039 is almost zero, so that vertical line is very close to the imaginary axis. Okay, so that's all for the first specification provided to us. The second one I'm going to have a look at is my rise time, PR, for which the formula was equal to pi minus beta over omega d. And that needs to be equal to 30 seconds or less, okay? So what we need to find for TR is the line that defines a constant rise time in a complex plane. As we did here, right? That was our line. It was defining constant settling time. So we shall do the same thing, but for the rise time step. And if you remember, the line of constant rise time was starting along the imaginary axis at some non-zero values and would grow and eventually converge very, very far away to a constant value. So our job essentially is to find those two boundary points here and whenever we have converged ultimately here. Or in other words, we're going to select or calculate omega d for a beta angle, remember that beta in a complex plane is this angle, okay? So we want to relate omega d to those two boundary conditions. Our omega d calculated at beta equal exactly pi over 2. That would give us this point here along the imaginary axis because omega d is the imaginary part of any complex pole. And then we're going to calculate again an omega d, but this time with beta, whenever we have converged very far away, and we're going to approximate that at beta equal zero. Okay? So here we go. Omega d for beta equal pi over 2 will be then equal to uh, pi minus beta over 30, and that's whenever beta equal pi over 2, we're going to get, so for pi over 2, it's going to be 0 0.0524, which corresponds to this point here, okay? Omega d equal 0 0.0524. Now we need to figure out this other boundary uh, point here, and that's going to be by evaluating my beta equal to whatever this gets closer and closer to zero and ultimately equal to zero when that point is very far away, okay? Because if you take that point and you put it at infinity, the angle you need to shoot for it is going to be uh, almost equal to zero. So we are approximating it to be equal to zero. And that would give us pi minus beta over 30 whenever beta is zero. And therefore, the omega d value for that limit condition is going to be 0.104, which corresponds to the imaginary part of a pole located very far away. Equal point, point oh four. One oh four. Like that. Okay? And we know that we need to be above anywhere above this curve line. to ensure that we end up with TR, so that line here that connects those two boundary uh, values for omega d is your constant TR, anywhere along this line. 
I'm going to get TR equal 30 seconds. So anything above this line, as we discussed in the previous lecture, will give us a TR, which is lower than 30. And that'd be great. Okay? So now we've figured out TS, TR, in terms of regions of where we could locate our poles in a complex plane to satisfy those two specs. And the last one is maximum overshoot. MP, given by the exponential of minus pi zeta over square root of 1 minus zeta square multiplied by 100 because mp is always provided in terms of percentage. So it says mp equal to 30% is the spec provided to us. Or in other words, equal to mp 0.3 without the 100% factor there. Okay, so what I'm going to do is take the natural logarith uh, logarithmic operator on both sides to end up with minus pi z over square root of 1 minus zeta equal to ln of 0.3. Now, as expected, mp is only function of the damping ratio, okay? But turns out that a constant damping ratio in the complex plane is found along a line with constant beta. Okay? For a given beta angle, you're going to get constant damping ratio along this line, and therefore, that will be your line of constant MP. Now, if you want to have something a little bit better than 30%, say 25%, it means that you need to go inside the region defined by a constant beta angle like that. So the question becomes, what is this angle beta that defines the line of constant MP, or in other words, the line of constant uh, damping ratio zeta? Well, for that, we need to go back to uh, relationship I gave you last time, which is tangent of this angle equal to something that, surprise, surprise, is only function of zeta, like that. Hmm. That's very convenient because if you look at that relationship and the one we have obtained on top here for the MP spec, you have the zeta over square root of 1 minus zeta square, which is exactly what we have here on the right-hand side of that equation. And therefore, you could write that as being minus pi over tan beta equal natural logarithm of 0.3. Or alternatively, beta is going to be equal to R tan of the ratio being minus pi over ln 0.3, which is your maximum overshoot in terms of percentage divided by 100. Okay? So by combining again those two relationships, you can directly uh, bridge the gap between beta as an angle and your spec on MP, which is your 0.3. And that would give you beta equal approximately to 69 degrees. So just by taking one spec at a time and figuring out the allowable region and complex plane to satisfy the spec and even go a little bit beyond and provide the client with better specs, then the remaining task is just to combine all these, all these regions together to determine uh, what we want in terms of closed loop uh, pole locations. And therefore, based on that, 
evaluate zeta and omega n that we are shooting for, and based on two characteristics, calculate kp and kd, okay? So let's go back to our complex plane. Real, imaginary. We have this line of mp. We have this line for ts. And we have this line something like that okay so constant ts is anything to the left of this vertical line for mp anything below this inclined line at 69 degrees and that is your line of constant tr for which we need to be above. So to the left, below, and above means that you have to be within this small section to simultaneously satisfy all transient time domain specifications. Okay? So that line was at point, point 0.039. This maximum height here was at 0.0524 at infinity. Okay, so that's if you extend this line over here. Like that. And then there is an angle here that defines, again, the line of constant NP at 69 degrees. So all in all, there is a multitude possibility of solutions that you can shoot for and end up within this region to satisfy all requirements. Now, obviously, you don't want to go overboard and say, well, I'm just going to pick a pole at minus infinity plus infinity and call it a day. Because, yes, the system will respond very fast because your TS would be, you know, much further to the left and everything would be satisfied. But then the amount of power and torque you need to torque the spacecraft, not in a hundred seconds, but within 0.1 seconds would be outrageous. So you have to be cautious about, yes, want to do better than the specs, but without going overboard, okay? Because those kind of over specs that you would be shooting for would be impractical to realize given some uh, constraints on the actuator's place within the spacecraft. So because these were reasonable specs on the clients, it's okay to go a little bit beyond and uh, shoot for better specs, but again, uh, be reasonable in your assumptions here. So I decided myself to select my desired pole locations at minus 0.05 okay so that was minus 0 .0, 0 0.039 I'm a little bit further to the left to compensate for the fact that I cannot be immediately uh, right next to the line because of this offset if you will minus 0 0.05 and plus minus 0.1 J to ensure that I end up uh, above this kind of uh, limit here, which is my lower limit on the imaginary part of my pole. So doing so would give me good uh, specifications. But that's just my call. You could have chosen a different uh, pole locations and that would have worked probably just as well. Okay, so now that we've selected where we wanted our closed loop poles in a complex plane that would satisfy simultaneously those three requirements provided to us, the next step is to figure out omega n square and two zeta omega n. Why is that? Well, because if you remember from the discussion we had on the way to calculate 
KP and KD, whenever we are dealing with a single axis rotational motion of a spacecraft, mathematically uh, modeled by the double integrator dynamics and controlled by a modified PD controller, which is what we're, we are dealing with here, the equations were a second order transfer function. So this is how we had done the mapping between KPKD and the standard terms found in a second order transfer function. Remember that? Just based on that, I then need to figure out omega n square and two zeta omega n, and from there calculate my KP, KD gain for a given inertia matrix or principal moment of inertia about a single axis, which was, which was provided to me here. Okay, omega n square. Turns out that omega n square corresponds to the norm of a pole square, or in other words, the real part square plus the imaginary part squared such that omega n square would give me 0 0.0125. This is just the measured from uh, the origin of the complex plane and your pole location in terms of drawing a straight line, okay? Take your tape measure and measure that. That's the norm of the pole that gives us this value in this particular case. Okay. Uh, and zeta omega n is actually the real part of your pole, right? So two zeta omega n will be 0.1. Because again, zeta omega n is this, so 2 times this is equal to 0 0.1 in terms of positive numbers, right? Because that actually corresponds to minus zeta omega n. Cool. One, two, five. So from there, you, you just take that and multiply both this and this with your J matrix to get directly Kp equal to 0 0.0125 times J. J was 1, so Kp is therefore simply 0.0125. Now the units. In your control law, you are calculating the torque, which is equal to Kp times the error minus Kd times derivative of the current orientation, like that. This is our modified PD controller, correct? As we've seen previously. So the units of each term better be Newton meter to get a torque. So that means that if the error is in radians, because error is the difference between the desired angle and the current angle, and therefore in radians, that means that KP needs to have units of Newton meter by radians. Boom. And therefore here, for the same reason, because of J is equal to 1, we have KD simply equal to 0.1. This needs to provide me with a torque as well, so Newton meter. But KD multiplying a, an angular rate is going to be divided by radians per second, like that. And this is how you can design a modified PD controller and apply that specifically to the case of a single axis rotational motion of a spacecraft on orbit, modeled via the double integrator dynamics model. Okay? Now, in practice, when you're going to apply this controller with those two specific values for control gains, KP and KD, the actual dynamics of a spacecraft will always be nonlinear and perturbed by some perturbations, as we've discussed in the past. But those uh, specific gains have been determined on the basis of the simplified dynamical model, the double integrator model, right? 
So there is a mismatch between the model that you employ for the design purpose and the actual uh, dynamics which uh, governs the rotational motion of the spacecraft. So those gains, when applied to the real spacecraft, will not give you exactly what you are looking for throughout the design, okay? So the performance won't match the theoretical performance in practice. You will see a slight degradation. So that's why it's always a good idea to over-design and shoot for better specs because we know that ultimately when this will be applied to the real spacecraft as implemented on board the flight computer, we're not going to get the results seen from the theoretical analysis, which is all based on the linearized equations of motion, whereas in practice, the spacecraft is governed by nonlinear equations of motion, okay? So just something to keep in mind. So all in all, you end up with a controller that on board the spacecraft calculates the torque about that single axis at any given time as a linear function of the error between the desired angle and the current angle has provided to you through some sensors, which would introduce noise, would introduce delays and uh, quantification effects and all those things. This minus KD, so 0.1, that multiplies the actual angular velocity about that given axis. And again, this would be provided by sensors. But that would be the equation that you would need to implement on board the flight computer that needs those two signal in terms of measurements. And I would calculate this torque that would need to be imparted onto the spacecraft. Now this torque, which is calculated by the computer or the controller, it's the same thing, would then need to be fed to a mechanical device, say a reaction wheel, which will then turn this torque into, uh, would take this torque, which is a software-based signal into uh, how would the wheels on board the spacecraft need to accelerate at that given instant to then produce that torque as calculated by the uh, control algorithm running on your computer, okay? Nice. So this concludes the section on transient time domain specification, which was section, ooh, I have lost track. I have completely lost track of the sections. Was it 5.4? Maybe. Can't hear you. <laughs> Doesn't matter. You'll figure this out on your own. Okay. Now we say, okay, well, all this analysis was for a modified PD controller that, uh, you know, it's very specific. Okay, let's leave it as that. It's very specific to a modified PD controller. But what if you were to choose, say, the regular or the standard PD controller that for the second term would be plus KD times the rate of change of the error itself. Or now you are considering that what you're tracking is not a constant angle, but a trajectory in terms of angle as a function of time, right? So that means that we shall look at some effects of additional zeros on the system's response. Because the modified PD controller, when we derive the closed transfer function and realize that that was equivalent to a standard second order transfer function as seen in systems and uh, simulations probably that you saw that for the first time, there were no zeros for the closed transfer function. But if you were to use this control line instead, which is KP times the error plus KD 
times the error rate, then that will introduce a zero to the closing transfer function. So the question is, what will be the effect of this additional zero on the response? Okay, so let's figure out the closed loop transfer function, which would end up being two zeta omega n s plus omega n square over s square plus two zeta omega n s plus omega n square, right? When we did the work here for the modified PD controller, all we had was this, omega n square over this denominator, and that was equivalent to a standard uh, second order transfer function, and this is how we had been able to do the mapping between KP, KD, and those uh, damping ratio natural frequency term. But now by considering that the reference signal can vary with time, then the error dot would be R dot minus theta dot, but in this case, R dot is no longer considered to be zero, and that's why we need to rely on the standard or the regular PD controller instead of, of the modified one. And we then end up with this, this transfer function to the closed loop transfer function, which means that if you look at the numerator now, we have an extra S term that wasn't there before. And that means that we have an additional zero to the two poles that are going to be located at the same location as they were before. But how will this additional zero modify things, okay? Uh, so to find out the location of the zero, you need to solve that equation for S, and that would give you S equal minus omega N over two zeta like that. Turns out this additional zero if you were to, compi to compare the modified PD response versus the standard PD. So now we have two poles as seen from this quadratic equation on the denominator of the transfer function, but we also have one zero. Whereas here, all we had for the modified PD were two poles no zeros. So by adding this additional zero, you're going to get a faster TP and a faster TR. Or in other words, lower values for those two transient, transient uh, time domain characteristics. Faster. And that typically makes you happy. It's a good thing. Compared to here, it's all compared with respect to the modified PD. So here you could say that TP and TR are a bit slower or larger values for, the, for those two parameters. And that's not, generally speaking, the best thing you can encounter. But the price to pay is that NP, thanks to this additional zero, or due to this additional zero, I should say, is going to be larger which is not super nice. Whereas here, NP was lower compared to the standard P, which is a good thing. Okay? Turns out this additional zero will have no effect on the stabilization time or the settling time TS. Okay? So just something to keep in mind in terms of adding additional zeros to the complex plane and what will be the effect on those uh, transient time domain characteristics. But the, the way that this additional zero is going to say uh, increase MP depends obviously on the actual location of the zero on the complex plane because not all additional zeros will have the same uh, effect in terms of influencing 
the system's response. So we're going to say that in general, zeros that are far away from the poles will have uh, less effects. Okay, so yes, adding an additional zero would lower uh, TR and TP will always be the case, but the further you move the zero away from the already existing poles, uh, the lesser the degree with which you're going to see an impact uh, will be obvious. Okay, so zero far away from the poles will have lesser effects. Okay, and vice versa, zeros as they get closer and closer to the poles, will have a much better impact on TR, TP, and MP. A larger impact. Okay. And another fact about adding zeros to complex plane uh, which was already populated by poles, is that if you end up with a zero on top of a pole, their respective effects of the pole and of that zero are negated. So if you happen to have a system with two poles like that, and you decide to place a zero here, it's as if you've completely eliminated the pole and the zero because they've canceled each other out, okay? So just something to keep in mind as you keep playing with more advanced linear controllers, I will introduce additional zeros to the complex plane. Okay, well, what about adding additional poles to the complex plane? That could be something that can very well happen. As we're going to see later on in this chapter, when we start talking about compensator as opposed to a controller. So compensator is just a more evolved form of a controller as we saw previously. The difference is that a compensator will also introduce some filtering or beneficial filtering effects on the system as a whole. So if you have noise in the system, that could be something that could help out reduce the adverse effects of the noise. But the price to pay is that they are a bit more complex and would introduce additional zeros and or poles to the overall complex plane. So it is, uh, it is quite important to understand the effects of throwing additional poles and zeros in a complex plane. So the question now that you might have is, well, what would be the effects of adding additional poles to an already existing complex plane, a uh, complex plane populated with some poles and or zeros, additional poles. Unfortunately, the answer to that is that it really depends. Depends on what? on the location of these additional poles. But the rule of thumb is that those poles will always have an effect whenever they get close to the existing uh, poles and zeros. If you have a system with this, you say two zeros like that, and then you are adding an, an additional or some additional poles. Well, if those poles are in the vicinity of what is already existing, you're going to have an impact. But as soon as you move them at least five times further away along the real axis, then we're going to say that they have no effects anymore. No effects if five times 
further away along the negative real axis. Okay? That is the reality of adding additional poles is that it's not as black and white as it is for zeros. It really depends on where the poles are. So if you stand, say, here, then it's going to have a moderate impact, but it's not that easy to quantify that uh, just like this, okay? So that really concludes the uh, discussion I want to have on transient time domain specifications. So the next thing I'm going to talk about today is the steady state. time domain specifications. So the only uh, steady state time domain specifications, I'm going to say that this is section 5. Point, I don't know. I forgot. Or is it 5.5.5.5? Something maybe? I'll let you figure this out based on the section number we gave for transient time domain specifications. Unfortunately, I kind of lost track. Those notes are all handwritten. Uh, so I should type them up one day, but that will come in future years, okay? Um, so yeah, the steady state specifications will be given in terms of the steady state error. That's what we're looking for. Because in practice, not all systems would generate uh, a similar steady state error. Ultimately, you will see that it's going to depend on the number of integrators you have or number of poles you have at the origin in the complex plane for the open loop transfer function. So based on that number of poles at that specific location, that is going to dictate if we will or maybe not have any steady state error. But not only depends on number of poles at the origin, but also on the, on the kind of reference signal we are trying to track. Because tracking a step input command, R and T, because this is a time domain lowercase letter, if you're trying to track this, it is a lot easier than to track something that will look like a... Uh, like a ramp, for example, because now the reference signal is time varying. So some system will be able to track this kind of signal with zero steady state error, yet if you were to feed them with a ramp, it would oscillate, but converge to a, zero, uh, a response that has a non-zero steady state error, okay? And as you keep increasing the complexity of the reference signal, that the control system is meant to track, well, it's going to get more complex to obtain zero steady state error, and the solution would be to add additional poles directly at the origin of a complex plane until you see that error shrinking and becoming zero, if that's what the control system uh, is meant to be. Because in some applications, it is totally fine to have some residual steady state error, so we don't always need to add a ton of poles at the origin uh, until you get steady state error equal to zero. Okay. So specifically in this section, we will see how to calculate the steady state error given three types of reference signal. One, two, and three. R, R, R. The first one is going to be a step input command, like that. Where in a time domain, surprise, surprise, it is only a constant, which is time invariant, one. But in the S domain, this turns into one over S, okay? This is the equivalent of this in a time domain. So this is a step command. 
Next one is a ramp command, which looks like that as a function of time uh, with a slope of one, such that the definition of this ramp in the time domain will simply be t. But in the s domain, that turns into 1 over s squared. And finally is a parabolic command. Okay, which in the time domain is t squared over 2, but in the s domain that turns into 1 over s cubed. So we shall see in this sub subsection how to figure out the steady state error for each of those three type of reference signals for and relate that to the number of integrators we have in the system or the number of poles we have at the origin of the complex plane and do the work for uh, no poles at the origin, one pole at the origin, or two and more poles at the origin. All right. Now, as I said, uh, not all systems will be able to track a given reference signal as well as other systems. And the way to determine that is solely based on the number of poles located at the origin of the complex plane. Okay? Or alternatively, the numbers of anti greater. Number of integrator of what? Contained within the plant model or contained within the controller itself or a combination of both? Well, the answer is going to be the number of integrators contained in the open loop transfer function. Okay? And it turns out that number of integrators is corresponding to the number of 1 over s we have in that transfer function or the number of poles at the origin within that transfer function is giving us what's known directly as the system type. Okay? So a system type 0 means that there is no integrator contain the open loop transfer function. A system type 1 means that this transfer function would look like something over S times something. Only one integrator like that. A type 2 system that implies that the transfer function for the open loop system would look like this. Okay? With 1 over S square at the bottom, and so on and so on. Good. Now to obtain the steady state error in terms of uh, the Laplace or the S domain, we need to go back to a fundamental feedback control system loop. It will always look like this, unless otherwise noted. Okay. Plus, minus, you have, you have RS here, the reference signal in the S domain. You have the output of the plant quantified through its transfer function denoted by GP of S. Here you have your controller quantified through the transfer function denoted by GC of S, such that here you have the error signal in the uh, S domain. 
and obviously the signal relating control in the plant is your U signal like that, okay? So if you look at the error signal, E of S, just by reading the block scene diagram, you have RS minus the current output of the plant. Where the current output of the plant is actually obtained by mu times g of p, but you know that mu is obtained from error times g of c. So directly I'm going to write e of s, g c of s, to get ultimately this is equivalent to u, that multiplies the plant's transfer function. So all this is for the error in the S domain, which I can solve for by saying error times 1 plus GC GP equal to R, or equivalently, that the error between the command and the actual output of the plant is going to be R over 1 plus GC GP. Those two transfer functions multiply together. Okay. Or, because we know that if you come back here and you disconnect the feedback loop, all you get in terms of transfer function relating the output and the reference signal will be what's known as the open loop transfer function or just the direct path from R to Y straight across. Which means that the open loop transfer function will simply be the multiplication of GC with GP. So I'm going to rewrite this as being R plus G open loop transfer function would give me my error signal in the S domain. But that is the error in the S domain. I wanted to quantify the steady state error in the time domain, right? That was the objective because the client would give you spec in terms of steady state error in the time domain. What does he want? Okay? So you need to convert that signal from S domain to error in the time domain. And furthermore, what you want is not the error, but the steady state error, as time is equal to infinity. We're going to say that steady state error in the time domain is going to be evaluated uh, as the limit of time towards infinity of the signal defined in the time domain. Turns out that this is perfectly equivalent to taking the limit of s towards zero of s times the error signal in the s domain, like that. But because we have already obtained an expression for this from that over there, we're going to say that the steady state error in the time domain is going to be simply evaluated by a limit s towards 0 of s times r over 1 plus g open loop transfer function. Okay? So different system types would have different steady state error by virtue of the fact that the steady state error depends on G open loop, okay, as shown there. It also depends on the type of reference signal you are trying to track. And because within J open loop or G open loop, you're going to get either 0, 1, 2, 3 integrators or poles at the origin. When we get to evaluate the limit of S towards 0 of everything, well, number of 1 over S terms encapsulated within G open loop will have a great effect ultimately on steady state tracking error in the time delay, okay? So that's going to be the bulk of the work for the remaining of this lecture.
But before we do the actual analysis for the three type of reference signals and number of integrators varying from zero to whatever, let's go back to the generic expression for an open loop transfer function, okay? Which could be quantified as some static gain k bar that multiplies a series of s terms minus z terms. And you could go all the way to z subscript m, as we've seen in the preliminaries for this chapter. Now, the denominator, generally speaking, could also be uh, represented by a term on its own, which is s to the power n, that multiplies s minus p1, s minus p2, all the way to s minus p n, like that, okay? So whenever you are able to factor out an S term out of those parentheses, you have to do so to, uh, to really showcase the number of integrators you have for this open loop transfer function and thereby finding the system type you are dealing with. Is it a type 0? Is it a type 1, 2, 3? So the N number here is actually your system type directly because that is the number of poles at the origin of your complex plane. Now M corresponds to the number of zeros, obviously, and N, small n, will be the number of poles that are not at S equals zero. Because number of poles at S equals zero is capital N. Okay. Turns out that this open loop transfer function can also be written slightly differently. I'm going to use just K now for the static gain because it's going to be different than K bar because we are essentially factoring out all the Z's and all the P's out of that transfer function to write it as T Z1 S plus 1 T Z2 S plus 1 blah 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 all the way to T Z M S plus 1 I am going to factor out my P's out of that to be able to write them in terms of uh, plus 1. So S and doesn't change. And I have T P1 S plus 1 times T subscript P2 S plus 1. Blah, 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 all the way to T P N S plus 1. Okay, and the reason why I've been able to write this with this term with some constant numbers in front of my s variables all over the place and those terms being added to 1 at each and every time instead of having the variable s without any factors and them being subtracted from uh, all the z's and all the p's is because my k here is different. Otherwise, those two equations will match up, right? Such that I can relate my new k to the old one by just multiplying it with minus z1 minus z2 all the way to minus zm. And same thing on the denominator. To relate k to k bar, it's going to be minus p1, minus p2, blah, 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 all the way to minus p, and like that. And where my tp12 n, my tz12345678m are all 
equal to, so I'm going to say Tz i, so i being either 1, 2, or all the way to m. Or actually just minus 1 over zi. And similarly, similarly for the poles, my t, p, i coefficients that are multiplying the s variables on the denominator of this transfer function are simply minus 1 over p, i. And here it is for all i equal to 1 all the way to n, and here it was for all i equal 1 all the way to m, like that, okay? So I just went from one way to represent any transfer function to another way like that, okay? And those two are equivalent to each other. But the real takeaway here is that we want to express our transfer function such that we can factor out any s the power n terms from the denominator, denominator such that we can evaluate right away the system type we are dealing with. Okay. So let's do the first reference signal, step input, and figure out what will be the steady state error whenever we are feeding closed loop transfer function of the closed loop control system altogether with a reference signal, which is just a step input. And we're going to evaluate the steady state error for different system types to see what will be necessary in terms of number of integrators at the origin of the complex plane to ensure that we do not get uh, any steady state error in the long run whenever the reference is a step input okay which means that we are at rs equal one over s okay well let's go back to the definition of my steady state error in the time domain and how this was related to the reference signal, and you will hopefully remember that expression, okay? And there's an S here. S R over one plus G open loop. While my R here is very specific, it's going to be one over S. I'm going to say a limit of S over zero of uh, of 1 over 1 plus G open loop transfer function. Okay? And because the only thing that depends on S in this object here is G open loop, I could rewrite the steady state error in the time domain as being 1 over 1 plus and just apply the limit of s toward 0 to this guy here. Limit s toward 0 of my open loop transfer function. Now for ease of further development, I'm going to refer to this limit of g open loop to be equal to ksp, simply. Okay? And we'll see what KSP is equal to for type 0, type 1, or above 1. And then relate that directly to the steady state error. I'm going to say where KSP for type 0. So if you have a type 0, it means that you're open loop transfer function looks like k times t z1 s I'm using the second form of representing a transfer function, the one I've just derived or obtained blah blah blah, all the way to t z m s 
plus 1, and all that was divided by S to the system type, and then your T P1 S plus 1, all the way to T P N S plus 1, like that. Okay, well, if the system type is 0, that means that, first off, capital N is equal to 0, it's going to be 1. But then, uh, let me just use the magic of the board here. I'm substitu substituting this S to the power N with 1 simply, okay? So that's what I have for type 0 open transfer function, which means that whenever I get to calculate my KSP, which is obtained through the limit of this, whenever S is equal to 0, I am going to get simply K, right? Because all the S terms disappear, I'm going to be left with a bunch of 1s multiplied together and a bunch of 1s here multiplied together on the denominator as well times k. Okay? Okay, this is k. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> so, let's report that result over here. So for type 0, we have k is p equal to k. Now let's do this work again, but this time assuming that we have a type 1. And again, remember that this is a generic formulation for my open transfer function. This time, n is equal to 1. So I need to leave this S term on the denominator. And when you get to evaluate KSP, instead of giving you a finite value equivalent to the static gain of your open transfer function, you are going to get infinity. Right? Because I'm going to get k times 1 over s times 1, or just k over s, but if s is equal to 0, it's k over 0, and therefore ksp obtained by this is indeed infinity. And if you were to do the same uh, analysis for type 2, you get 2 here, and still end up with ksp equal infinity. Type 3, capital N is equal to 3. And you would also get infinity. So for type 1 and up, you will always obtain KSP equal to infinity. Okay? Which means it means that the steady state tracking error. for type 0 open loop transfer function or type 1 and up are going to be different because the KSP values are different. KSP for type 0 we had obtained K but KSP for type 1 was infinity so now we need to relate those values to the steady state error in the time domain and that was done through here, 1 over 1 plus KSP. It's going to be 1 over 1 plus K. Whereas here, if you substitute infinity for KSP, it's going to be 1 over 1 plus infinity, or 1 over infinity, or simply 0. So, that means ultimately that if the reference signal is a step input command we're still within the step input command right if you have a type 0 in red you're going to get a response that will oscillate or will ultimately converge to something different than uh, what you wanted and that error is going to be quantified by ESS equal 1 over 1 plus K. Now this K 
here that you have in this transfer function comes from where? That was the static gain of my open loop transfer function itself being the multiplication of my controller and my plant. Well, in our case, the plant in space gravitational motion about a single axis is simply 1 over j s squared. This is our fundamental double integrator dynamical model. So this k, which is a static gain, does not come from the plant. It is impossible. The plant only has one on the numerator in terms of its transfer function. So this k is probably coming from the controller then. So by tuning the controller, or in this case by increasing the gain of your controller, you would ultimately reduce the steady state tracking error. Yet, you will always have a remaining steady-state tracking error value different than zero because you cannot crank your gain of your controller to be equal to infinity. That would just be silly, right? Because you would get 1 over 1 plus infinity, the steady-state tracking error. Congratulations. Good luck trying to find a reaction wheel that can torque the spacecraft with that much power, okay? But... Instead of trying to reduce steady state tracking error to exactly zero by cranking the static gain of your open loop transfer function, or alternatively, in other words, by cranking the gain of your controller, the better solution would be to have a controller that has, uh, that provides, and well, would be to ensure that the open loop transfer function would have at least one integrator at the origin. Turns out, just by virtue of what we have for the plant, we already have an S squared term on the denominator. So unless those two integrators are canceled by the specific controller you are using, you should be good to go because you would end up with a type 2 in the spacecraft rotational motion, okay? you would get something that converges exactly to the command with no steady state error. Good. So after I'm done talking about the three different type of reference signals for different types of open transfer function, we're going to do a quick look at what we end up with for a spacecraft rotational motion but one axis whenever the angular rates are considered to be small, i.e. using the double integrator dynamical model and decoupling the dynamics about all three axes, okay? So let's repeat this kind of analysis to the ramp input. Ramp input, the S domain, is rs equal to 1 over s square. Again, let's go back to ESS in the time domain, which was obtained by the limit of s towards 0 of s times r of s over 1 plus g open loop. That never changes. What changes is what you plug in for r of s, meaning that here's going to be a limit of s towards 0 of 1 over s squared, that is my r of, r of s times s, 1 plus g, open loop. Boom, boom, or in other words, 1 over s and 1 plus g, open loop. Okay, or alternatively, I have ESS equal to 1 over S plus S G open loop and limit of S towards 0. Well, that obviously, For the first S I can already set equal to 0 and just leave 1 over the limit of s towards 0 of s times g open loop. I cannot already at this point cancel this s out because it will ultimately depend on what is my open loop transfer function equal to. 
because within GOP loop, I probably have a bunch of S as terms, which I will then multiply with this extra S and then evaluate the limit, okay? This one I could already set to zero because it is on its own. That's fine. So here we're going to set, uh, or we're going to define this as being equal to K as V or K as V equal by definition to the limit S towards zero of S times G open loop. one over k s v where k s v was here defined like that okay so what we're going to do is evaluate what is k s v equal to and then relate that to the steady state error through this very simple relationship one over k s v where k s v limit s over zero of s that multiplies our open loop transfer function. Nice, nice. Well, as you know by now, the open loop transfer function will vary depending on the system type, the number of s to the power n. So if you have a type zero, it means that g open loop again is going to be k times t z1 s plus 1 blah, 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 all the way to t z m s plus 1 all this over t p1 s plus 1 blah, 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 t p n s plus 1 and here let's not forget about s to the power n so, for type 0, it means that our open loop transfer function doesn't have any S term here on its own, which means that KSV, which is going to be the limit of S times all of that, I'm just going to put my S here, to see what we're doing, is going to be equal to those parentheses turn out to be just a bunch of ones, so we are left with limit of s toward zero of s times k or simply equal to zero. Let's go back here and report that result. Type zero, k is v equal to zero. Okay? So let's do the same work, but this time for type one, open loop transfer function. Type one n is equal to 1, so we're left with that, and ksv is actually limit s towards 0 of s times g open loop, meaning that when I multiply all of this with s, those two s terms will cancel out, and I'm going to be left with k. So for type 1, ASV is equal to K. All right. Let's redo the same quick analysis whenever capital N is equal to 2. So if it is equal to 2, get the square term here on the bottom. But then we need to multiply G open loop with S and evaluate the limit that S is equal to 0. Boom, boom. So we're going to get ultimately limit s or zero of what? Of k over s or infinity. So type 2 and up. We're going to get ksv equal to infinity. Nice. And you could repeat the same analysis for type 3, 4, 5, 6. And at that point, we'll always end up with KSV equal to infinity. To summarize what we have for ramp input, we have our steady state tracking error that depends on KSV through this very simple relationship. 
and that would be pipe zero, KSV zero. Pipe one, KSV calculated as being equal to K. Type 2, KSV equal to infinity, such that the steady state tracking error that we can expect out of such an open loop transfer function, whenever the ramp corresponds to the reference signal, will be 1 over 0 or infinity. Okay? Here, KSV is K, so then steady state tracking error will be 1 over K much better already but if you have a type 2 and up KSV is infinity and therefore ESS is 0 so as you can see in the previous analysis we had type 1 providing us a steady state tracking error of 0 for a unit input command okay but here the same open loop transfer function being fed with a ramp instead of a step input, all of a sudden ends up with a constant steady state tracking error. All this to say that type 1 open loop transfer function has a harder time tracking a ramp than it had tracking a step input command. And that is true as well for the type 0. Type 0 ended up with our steady state tracking error to be 1 over 1 plus k. It's constant value but here the error is infinity that's not too good because now the ramp is a more difficult reference signal to track for a given controller so if you want to track a ramp with no residual steady state tracking error you better ensure that the open loop transfer function or the multiplication of controller in the plant has at least two uh, integrators or two poles at the origin of the complex plane. <clears throat> okay? Now, the third kind of reference signal to look at is the parabolic input. Parabolic input, and that is Rs equal 1 over S cubed. And if you were to redo the same kind of analysis that we did previously two times, uh, you could end up with ESS equal to 1 over KSA, where KSA was defined to be the limit of S towards 0 of S squared times our open transfer function we go back to our open transfer function generic formulation, analyze the first situation where n, capital N is equal to 0. That would be for type 0. Look at how KSA would be equal to. That's 0, KSA. And then plug KSA back into here to figure out the steady state tracking error that we would obtain whenever the reference signal is a parabolic input like that so for type 0 you figure that KSA is 0 such that 1 over 0 gives you infinite steady state tracking error type 1 will also gives you KSA is equal to 0 and therefore infinity for the steady state tracking error for type 2 that was giving us zero tracking error to a ramp input. Now it gives us 1 over k tracking error. Oh, so now that tells you that a type 2 open transfer function has a harder time to track this kind of command. So if you want to track this parabolic input with no residual steady state tracking error, turns out that you need a type 3 and up to obtain infinity for KSN, therefore 1 over infinity, 0 steady state uh, tracking error. So, the general conclusion of this kind of analysis is that if you want to reduce the steady state tracking error for a higher or a much or, how can I work that out? 
if you want to reduce the steady state tracking error as you increase the complexity of the reference signal that you are wishing to track, then you need to add additional poles at the origin of the complex plane. Or make sure that inherently the open transfer function has sufficient poles already in place at the origin of the complex plane such that what you are trying to track will end up with not infinite steady state tracking error, okay? That would be the worst situation. So I would say at least a finite steady state tracking error could be applicable, but if you're looking for zero steady state tracking error, then make sure that you have additional uh, poles at the origin or additional or sufficient integrators to end up in that situation here, okay? Uh, so let's see what we actually have when we relate this generic uh, theory to our specific problems, specific problem at hand, which is the spacecraft single axis rotational motion control. And again, I'm going to use the modified PD controller as my controller of choice for all the reasons that we talked about previously okay, simple to implement uh, robust to uh, integrator wind up effect robust to noise and things like that okay so RS gets compared with the output of my plant that like to generate the error signal this error signal will get multiplied with my proportional gain KP. This contribution will get subtracted with my KB times S that multiplies the output okay, minus. Then give me the net control torque applicable to my spacecraft that info model about the single axis j s square so that would be that control torque in the s domain here and that would be the rotational angle theta of s and that would be the desired angle okay so the first thing we need to figure out is what kind of system type are we practically dealing with in that specific situation well, the first thing we'll do is to combine those two together, as we did in the past, and that will turn out to be 1 over JS squared plus KDS on the denominator, and then times KP, okay? I'm going to say that this boxing diagram could be simplified by combining my three blocks into a single transfer function that calculates a rotation angle. And that gets fed back and compared with the reference signal as function of time or reference rotation angle. We get the error in orientation of our spacecraft. Okay? So this new transfer function here is simply those two combined times kp, which that those two combined is js squared plus KDS, just like that, okay? So now, what is my open transfer function? Well, easy peasy, disconnect the feedback branch, and then the direct path from R, as domain, to the output of everything, theta, is going to be this transfer function. That's KP, or J, S square plus K D S. Okay. So just based on that, you know that you can rewrite this as being K P over S to the power one that will multiply J S plus KD. How many integrators we have in a specific situation where our double integrator dynamics 
is uh, controlled by our modified PD controller. Well, just look, S to the power one. So therefore, capital N is equal to one. And meaning that we have a system of type one. This is by looking at what we have here, okay? I never do the mistake of trying to figure out the system type by uh, calculating the closed loop transfer function. It's always from the open loop transfer function that you determine the system type. I'm going to say that once more. The system type is always coming from the open loop transfer function without any feedback. Okay? So what do we know about system type 1? Well, from the previous analysis, that means that the steady state tracking error, the step input command, is going to be equal to zero. That's good. You tell the spacecraft point at 45 degrees above the yaw angle. Currently, the spacecraft is at zero degrees, so the angle will go from zero all the way to 45 with some oscillations and overshoot and ultimately converge exactly to 45 degrees because the command was simply the time domain go to 45 degrees okay that's what i want or go to 30 degrees okay such that the current angle one moment please I'm back on. Apparently there's a tornado coming towards us, so I'd better wrap this soon, and luckily I'm at the very end here, okay? So no steady state error whenever the control system is trying to track a set point angle. What would happen for a ramp? Well, if you're trying to track a ramp, you know from the previous analysis that ESS is one over KSV, and that KSV was obtained as the limit of S towards zero of S times G open loop. What do we have here? This is our open loop. So S times G open loop, cancel the S on the bottom, S is equal to zero, boom, be the bang, you end up with KSV equal to KP over KD. This is KSV such that ESS to a ramp is 1 over KSV and therefore ESS is going to be KD over KP. Okay? So if you tell the spacecraft, I want you to go from an angle of zero and you reach pi over two in that amount of second specifically, the control system will say, okay, taking a spacecraft, well, some oscillations. This is a modified PD, so this is damped oscillations. But, oh, gee, I can't keep up with the command here. I'm going to always provide a steady state error, which is quantified as KD over KP. Now increasing the KD of your controller would then reduce. Uh, now increasing the KP of your controller would, as I've discussed previously, reduce uh, the state state tracking error of that uh, specific situation. But there are obviously adverse effects of increasing KP, uh, such as noise amplification, and also the fact that your actuators you have on board may not be able to provide you with enough torque to do that kind of response. Okay? I hope that that helped you connecting what you've learned and passed in terms of system types and steady state tracking error. You probably saw that in your feedback control system course. If that's the first time you've seen this theory, great. 
I think uh, we covered it thoroughly today. And we also looked at this specific application of spacecraft rotational motion about one axis uh, and figuring out what will be the error in the long run for different type of uh, angle that we're wishing to uh, shoot for. Hope you enjoyed that one. I'm gonna go upstairs taking care of my bonsai collection before the tornado sweeps them all out and break them off. So stay safe. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.